Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on Sunday. And um, this is the fourth and final part of our workshop series in January. And this one is targeted to domestic well users. So we've been hosting these workshops with the purpose of, of building capacity and working with residents to inform them about drinking water needs within the Cuyo Water Foundation service area. So we had two workshops on uh, January 7th and January 16th. Those were identical and those were about water quality and nitrate related information. And then we had um, a community water systems workshop on January 19th. And today we are focusing on domestic well users. So today's workshop is happening in both Spanish and English with options to join by Zoom or by toll-free telephone. There's also a number to call for technical difficulties, which I'm hearing we're having a little bit on the Spanish workshop right now. So please call 559-325-4463 for bilingual assistance and Deborah will help you. We will do a Q&A and those are connected between both workshops. And in this workshop today, we have Malka Copel joining us from Sacramento State. I'm Sarah Rutherford. I am serving as the Interim Executive Director and Technical Lead. And we also are joined by Courtney Mancor, who is our host. So I wanted to start off by talking about the purpose of this meeting in addition to capacity building is to, to get feedback. And we really value feedback in this exchange, even though it's online, we're hoping it to feel, um, feel a little more casual and a little bit more as though we were in the same space. So. As we receive community feedback, it'll help the Kuiya Water Foundation um, help shape what solutions might look like for um, users whose water is impacted by nitrates. We'll also take this information and we have an advisory committee and a board of directors and we'll be sharing this information with them as well. We're also in the process of developing an early action plan, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. And we will, um, within that early action plan, we will be describing the avail availability, location, and different types of replacement water solutions. Um, we're also looking for information um, to help develop replacement water and well sampling programs, which we'll talk about in a minute too. So we do have um, a submittal coming up. And so for this first round of feedback, which we'll, we'll continue this um, process in the years to come, but we are asking for feedback before February 17th to be included in the EAP development. Once we have that draft completed, we'll be sharing widely with people to give us feedback on the EAP itself, and we'll then be incorporating that feedback before submitting to the regional board. Um, so I'll move on to how to make your voice heard, how to interact with the Kuya Water Foundation. We will show this again later, but we have set up an email account. We also have a local phone number where either a live person will answer or you can leave a voicemail at any time in either Spanish or English. And we also have a physical address. We are on Facebook and Instagram. And again, we have the Kuya Water Foundation website where you can log in to find out about upcoming meetings, currently none are scheduled, or the, the early action plan progress. You can also sign up for emails to receive information, um, ongoing information and communications. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, we have, we're going to have three presentations today. Uh, the first will be an overview about drinking water in this area, which if, if any of you have attended previous uh, workshops, it'll be similar to that. Um, but we're going to focus um, the agenda on talking about uh, domestic wells, um, because that is the purpose of this workshop. Um, as in previous meetings, we'll pause during the presentations to give you a chance to ask questions while we are presenting. Um, we might take a break if we need to. Uh, we'll, we'll play it by ear, um, but we, we want to make sure that you have a chance to ask questions during the presentations as well as after the presentations. Um, as Sarah said, the meet this meeting is being recorded and it will be available on the website and the PowerPoint will be available too. Uh, so um, checking here to see if people have, uh, at the moment everybody is participating um, via the Zoom. We, ha we do not have any phone participants yet. Um, but so, and it's a, a small enough group that 
I think we might just go around the virtual room and have people introduce themselves if you are comfortable. So I'm just going to uh, call on you. And if you, if you like, um, please share your name. And if you have an affiliation, your affiliation. So I'll start with JP. Hi, I'm JP Cataviella. I am the administrator of the Central Valley Dairy Representative Monitoring Program. Welcome. Jonathan. Hi, this is Jonathan Nelson with the Community Water Center. Thank you. Uh, Lisa says she has no microphone at this time. So welcome, Lisa. Lisa is joining us with the South Valley Industrial Collaborative. Trisha. Hi, this is Trisha with the Farm Bureau. Blanca. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Blanca Scobedo with Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Welcome. And Donald. Hello, uh, Donald Akamia with the Kuwait Basin Water Quality Association. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Let's continue. As an introduction, who is the Kuwait Water Foundation? Um, the foundation is a nonprofit. Um, located in Northern Tulare County and dedicated to maintaining and improving the quality of life within the Kauia Subbasin. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And by implementing programs that provide access to safe drinking water for residents and enhancing the quality of groundwater drinking supplies. So here's a, a map of the Kauia Water Foundation service area. Um, at the most northern point, it, it extends up to Highway 201 or 201, and then roughly follows Cottonwood Creek over to Goshen on the west side and down to Joaquina in the southwest portion. Um, on the south side, bordering to Larry and Lindsay, and then following up along through the foothills to a lot of our small communities. Um, for those of you who might have printed slides, we're now on slide 10. Um, there are recordings of the other workshops that I described earlier. Um, those are available at kawiawater.org. Again, those are understanding your drinking water and community water systems workshops. And you can view both the, the meeting materials and the, um, and the a video recording of those meetings as well. So with that, we'll start with a brief review of understanding your drinking water. Um, this is a condensed version of the part one um, workshop. So where does tap water come from? So water is provided to homes by a connection, either a public water system or a private domestic well. And approximately 90% of drinking water in Tulare County does come from groundwater. So what is groundwater? Um, in its simplest description, it's water between soil particles that has moved past the land surface and held in an aquifer. So water hits the surface and moves into the soil. Soil contains minerals and possibly chemicals from both natural and human sources. But these layers of soil also help to filter out bacteria and trash and insects. And as water moves through the soil, it can also move some chemicals and minerals into the groundwater aquifer. So what about these chemicals and minerals? Is it, is it good or bad or safe to drink? Well, some are essential for survival and some um, can be harmful, but it depends on the amount and the concentration of the chemical in the, or mineral. And these can also have an effect on your water's color or smell, taste, safety to drink, or hardness. So then a good example of hardness is maybe those little white deposits that you see on your shower head. So contaminants that we have seen locally that may have potential health impacts include nitrate, which is the focus of the Kuya Water Foundation's program, perchlorate, 1,2,3-trichloropropane, which is also referred to as TCP, 1,2-dibromo-3-chloropropane, excuse me, DBCP, um, arsenic, and that should be a separate line, but hexavalent chromium as well, and then trichloroethylene, also known as PCE. So as I mentioned, nitrate's the focus of the Kuya Water Foundation's program. Nitrate is a chemical composed of both nitrate and oxygen. I'm sorry, nitrogen and oxygen. Um, it can be produced naturally um, via lightning, 
or directly made by humans and animals as waste products. So sources of nitrate in groundwater can come from agricultural sources, um, nitrogen-based fertilizers commonly used in households, as I mentioned, natural or atmospheric, both sewage and septic waste, and also animal manure. So we'll take a brief pause here about understanding your drinking water and check in if there's any questions or discussions or if anyone's new that's joined. I don't think I see anyone new. Is, has anyone joined who uh, has not had a chance to introduce themselves? And are there any questions at this time or comments? All right, seeing none, let's continue. Okay, so moving forward. We'll now discuss domestic wells and nitrate impacted drinking water. So I described earlier what groundwater is. Let's talk about how groundwater is used. So it's pumped to the surface by wells that are submerged within the well. And the quality of the groundwater can be different depending on the location of the well and the depth of the well. So typically domestic wells are shallower, not as deep as community water system wells or irrigation wells. So how does a well provide drinking water? There is a pump located submerged beneath the surface. There's also a well screen at the bottom to prevent sand and rocks from entering into the well. There is a pressure tank and a power supply pumping the water to the surface. And there's a well cap preventing um, debris or insects or other um, physical items from entering into the well itself. And this slide just describes in detail for those who may have printed it what I just described um, in the visual before. So <clears throat> when using a domestic well, it's important to know if your water is safe to drink because private domestic wells, they are not legally required to test or to treat drinking water. And the only, the, really the only way to know if well water, your domestic well is safe to drink is to have that water tested by a qualified laboratory. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but how does a renter know if you have a well? So if you are renting your home or not the owner, um, you may not know if you have a well. And a good way to know is to either ask the landowner or to look around for, there's some pictures here of examples of a wellhead or a pump um, next to your home. So how do you test to know if your well water is safe? So again, as mentioned, the Kuya Water Foundation is focused on nitrate related issues, but also there may be other contaminants which make your water unsafe. And it's important to think about those when you have your well tested. So you can contact a qualified laboratory, I'll show in a minute, to ask them to come out and sample your well for you, or you can contact a local lab and they can give you specific instructions to sample it yourself. Um, I'll show the list of local labs in a minute. Also important, coming soon, the Kuya Water Foundation will offer a free domestic well testing program, which is scheduled to begin in May and, uh, May and June in 2021. So listed here, are two local laboratories, um, one in Visalia, one in Tulare. There are others within the Central Valley, but these are most local to us in the Kuya Water Foundation area. Um, Fruit Growers Laboratory will sample for nitrates, pesticides, and minerals. And the estimated cost for all of those constituents is approximately $200 if you take the sample yourself. Sierra Dairy Testing will we'll sample for nitrate only, and that's approximately $50. Once you get a well sampling report back, this is an example, and we'll talk briefly of how to understand the, the information displayed here. So typically on the furthest left, you'll see the type of chemical or the name. In this case, we're looking at nitrate as N. <clears throat> so the result here is indicated at 11, and we'll talk more in a minute. You would you would need to be aware that that is not safe to drink because anything at or over 10 is does not meet drinking water standards. These other categories are important. Most importantly would be the reporting limit. Because 10 is considered the threshold, you need to ensure that your laboratory 
analyzes your sample at, with a reporting limit less than the state drinking water standard. The, the other information here provides information on, or the additional columns here provide information on laboratory quality parameters, indicating whether or not the sample um, was analyzed appropriately. Um, typically, the first page of a lab report will tell you if there was any serious issues in the analytical process. So there are some existing well sampling programs available locally. Self-Help Enterprises currently has one that's ongoing. And as mentioned earlier, the Cuyo Water Foundation will be launching a domestic well sampling program as soon as May. So th there's no cost for that, that program. And we will be talking about, we'll be talking about it in the next slide as well. So if you have questions about um, general water quality safety or other constituents not, um, not regarding nitrate, and you can contact the Tulare County Health Department, which their website is listed here and their phone number is also listed here. Okay, with that, let's talk about maximum contaminant levels or a drinking water standard. So these are set to protect human health and they're set by both state and federal government. And they're different for each contaminant. So as I mentioned, the, the standard for nitrate is 10 milligrams per liter which is described as, which is a concentration. Um, but for other, other um, contaminants, it may be less, in many cases, is less than 10 milligrams per liter. So that standard for nitrate is 10 milligrams per liter. And we do know that some local wells have nitrate concentrations above 10 milligrams per liter. If, it's, if your well result is above 10 milligrams per liter in nitrate, it's your water should not be used for drinking, making formula, or cooking. Water high in nitrate can safely be used to bathe, clean, do laundry, wash dishes, and grow crops. There are possible health impacts related to nitrate. Nitrate can interfere with the blood's ability to, to carry oxygen and can result, result in nitrate poisoning known as ethomoglobioma, or also commonly known as blue baby syndrome. And symptoms can develop quickly, especially in infants, and include shortness of breath, blueness of the skin and or lips, and if it goes untreated, may be fatal. If you see these symptoms, medical attention should be sought immediately. Children under six months old and pregnant women are most at risk. If you find out that your water is high in nitrates, do not cook or drink your water because that is unsafe, and do not use your water to make any formula. Also, do not boil your water because boiling does not remove nitrates. And do not use a store-bought counter, pitch, counter pitcher filler, filter, my goodness, because that does not remove nitrates as well. But it is safe to bathe, do laundry, wash hands, clean and wash dishes. So we'll pause briefly there to talk about domestic wells and nitrates. Are there any questions at this time? Remember, you can uh, uh, type a question in chat. Uh, you can raise your hand using the participants tab, or you can just unmute yourself and speak. All right, I'm not seeing any raised hands at this time, so let's continue. So let's talk more about domestic wells in the area and those that may be impacted by nitrates. So we'll start here. We began looking at where there's the greatest density or number of domestic wells within the Cuyo Water Foundation service area. This figure illustrates in the darker brown wells, more than 20 wells per section, 20 wells or more per section, excuse me. And then the and gradually goes lighter for sections with fewer wells. We then looked at um, water quality data reported to a number of sources and where we saw a single sample that was over the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter, we've mapped those here. We've added a buffer around those points of a quarter mile. So then we put the two together and I apologize the color schemes didn't match. We didn't didn't get to that in time, but the idea here is, is similar. So in sections where there's more 
more domestic wells, you'll see a darker shade of purple. We've overlaid that with known exceedances. We're also beginning to review our ISO contour maps or heat maps, which are also showing us where predicted values indicate exceedances of nitrates. So using the process I've described here, we estimate approximately 922 domestic wells are in the proximity of a known exceedance of the nitrate standard. You can also see here that these exceedances aren't localized to a specific area. They are scattered throughout the, the Cuyah Water Foundation service area and they don't seem to follow any other um, easily identifiable um, geologic or surface um, features. So as you just saw in the previous figure, nitrate impacts are widespread throughout the service area. And your domestic well might be safe, you, that your own domestic well safety might be different than that of your neighbors just across the street. And so really well sampling is important because it's the only way to know for sure if your domestic well has water that's safe to drink. So I'll pause there briefly to review those figures or answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions at this time? Again, the question can be, can you say that again? I mm -hmm. <laughs> know that's a lot of information. All right, I'm not seeing or hearing any questions at this time, so let's continue. Thank you, happy to go back when once you've had a minute to, to think about it. So for those domestic well users um, that, that find out their water is impacted by nitrates, what are the possible solutions? So we think about this in both short-term and in long-term. And so short-term, may look, look something like using bottled water, maybe installing a reverse osmosis system, or perhaps using a local kiosk to fill your own bottles with water, or maybe some combination of the two. So a little bit more information on drinking water kiosks currently available. There's one available um, near the community of Oakieville at Avenue 229 and Road 48. There's also one available in just outside of Farmersville off of Highway 198 and Farmer, Farmersville Boulevard, um, just in front of the Cahuilla Delta Water Conservation District. So these are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Again, you would bring them bottles and fill them up. There's no limit on the amount of water that you can take home with you. And again, this is available now as we're working towards some of these other solutions. So some things to think about in, in evaluating if a kiosk is the right, right option for your family. Um, it does require transportation to get to the kiosk and get back home. And um, you would also need space to store the bottles, preferably out of sunlight, as that may introduce chemicals from the plastic. Um, the water available at kiosk does meet all drinking water standards. Registration is not required, um, but it's also important to think about scheduling and time so that you you don't run out of water and that you, you're able to get water in advance of needing it. So another option would be delivered bottled water. Again, this just requires some space to store it because you don't want it in sunlight. Um, these are typically delivered in five gallon jugs, which can sometimes be difficult to move or lift. You need to be able to predict or know how much water your family will use so that you don't run out. And there is that risk of running out to time to time, but in that event, maybe you could go to a kiosk or some other, some other source for bottled water. Um, but with bottled water, um, it does meet federal and state drinking water standards. So no maintenance or testing would be required. And that's important when we think about reverse osmosis. So reverse osmosis is a system that you might have installed underneath your sink. It's possible that it may not treat for other contaminants. 
it may also not remove enough nitrate if there's a lot of nitrate in your, your well water. It may not work well for water that is high in hardness. So those calcium and mineral deposits, um, but it is always available and you don't run the risk of running out. Um, however, it does require ongoing service and maintenance to have a technician come into your home and um, evaluate the system. So in terms of long-term solutions, I just described short-term, you know, get us through immediate solutions. The longer-term solutions for domestic well owners may include drilling a new well, modifying the depth of an existing well, possibly installing a treatment system, system at the wellhead, or maybe consolidate with a larger water system nearby. So in considering these drinking water solutions, it's important to, to kind of consider what's technically feasible and viable, um, what's, where's their drinking water safety, and then also community or, or individual household preference. And we really, we want to end up here in the middle where we have all three components working together. So in thinking about moving forward and developing these options to be made available within the foundation's area, um, May and June of 2021, we'll begin that domestic well sampling program. We'll also at that same time begin receiving those applications for bottled water delivery. Um, following 20, well, starting in 2021 and going into 2022, we'll continue to have these discussions about the possibility of constructing additional kiosks with keeping in mind the interest and the feasibility of those projects. And then ongoing um, throughout the next you know, couple of years and maybe longer, we'll be outreach and communications with communities and domestic well users. So in summary, short-term solutions include delivered bottled water, reverse osmosis systems, or drinking water kiosks. We are looking into the possibility of having bottled water available for pickup um, at specific locations throughout the service area. Um, we will be developing a no-cost well sampling program and, and review the long-term replacement water options or solutions for domestic wells include things like drilling a new well, modifying the depth, treatment at the wellhead, or consolidating with a nearby larger water system. So here we'd like to pause and ask some questions to those of you that are domestic well users. Of the things that I've just described, what situations make one, of, one or more of those solutions more attractive to you? Um, what are the criteria, the pluses, the minuses um, that are most important to you? And also, is there more information you would need from, from us to better guide your preference? And then lastly, how would you like to be updated on the Kuya Water Foundation's replacement water plans and progress? Yeah, we, we, um, uh, we can have a back and forth here if you just want to unmute yourself and Say what you think or ask a question, feel free. What is the current process by which most communities learn about their water quality situation? That's a great question. So um, in communities, as they are connected to a public water system, um, those public water systems um, annually release consumer confidence reports or if there's um, a known exceedance, they will notify their paid users. In the instance of domestic well users, that's a little bit more limited at this time. Self-help has engaged in, um, in reaching out to the community to let people know. Um, there's also other community-based organizations that are actively working with domestic well users to help inform them about these potential risks. Um, and I guess I would say that that's really one of the primary purposes purposes of the foundation is to expand on that outreach and that information um, that's that's being exchanged with especially domestic well users. Um, it's a diverse and and far-reaching um, group of users, and 
it, it takes a little bit um, more time to get to everybody. Um, we're also talking with the Tulare County Health Department. They have several ongoing projects, but none are targeted to domestic wells at this moment. And um, we're also talking with the Tulare County Health Department to have a larger campaign focused on, on this issue. Um, Tulare County Health Department's really busy with COVID and vaccinations right now. So hopefully we can partner with them more um, once they have some availability. What is the long-term plan for the Water Foundation's involvement in, in providing, we, we know there's a lot of discussion around short-term solutions or intermediate solutions, but what is kind of the 15 or 20 or 30 year outlook for replacement water in these communities? What would be the ideal outcome? I think we're working to, to um, define what, what the ideal part means. Um, the Water Foundation is tasked with several things in the long term. Um, one is to work with with um, industry and agricultural and dairy entities to better manage nitrates in their, their management practices um, to, to begin to restore the aquifer, um, to limit the amount of additional um, exceedances or issues within the aquifer and um, to even improve on those practices. Um, so we are also engaged in a number of technical studies to better understand where um, nitrate contamination exists. We are evaluating um, additional data sources. I, I think long-term, once we, as we gain more data, we may have a better understanding of where some localized impacts are. We currently, we currently can't see that with the data we have. Um, in terms of long-term solutions, um, I think it, it does easily get complex. So for, for public water systems, um, we've identified two um, areas within the Water Foundation, and those are the Lemon Cove area and the Joaquina area. Um, we, are, we are engaged with, with those communities and um, working with them to to make sure they get long-term or they get grants for um, infrastructure projects where needed or if there's something um, that the foundation can assist in assist in, assist in we will we will be there we are um, again reaching out to them and and talking with the community leaders in those areas um, long-term solutions for domestic well users um, I'll say include some of those things I mentioned earlier. Um, I would also say we're hopeful that technology advances and can provide um, maybe a solution that is more comprehensive that maybe could address multiple contaminants easily or treat for greater concentrations of nitrate. Um, I think the hope is that as we launch these programs, not just here in the Korea area, but there are similar programs in other places in the Central Valley, that maybe we gain some, um, some traction with technology and that this economy of scale, that it becomes economically important to um, developers to look at some of that technology with the increased awareness that maybe there's, there's a benefit for them to, to try and look into new things. Did I answer your question? I feel like I, that was long. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have another question from Jonathan. When will the draft EAP be released and how much time will there be for public comment? Right. So we are working on the early action plan right now. Um, our intent is to collect all of the feedback we're getting here today, as well as um, the other sources I described earlier, so that we can incorporate that into the plan itself to inform the process. We didn't want to develop the early action plan in a vacuum without hearing from communities. 
So that will be released for, I'll say, an administrative draft review on February 22nd. And we will share that with all interested parties. Um, we will then, um, we're, we're looking at how long we would have to incorporate um, those comments or feedback initially. Um, it looks like it would be pretty quick. We would need to have that finalized by March 8th right now. And so again, though, as I mentioned, there will be multiple, um, multiple chances for community engagement and feedback. And as we get that, we plan to go back to communities and, and individuals to, to be clear on how their input was included in that early action plan and, and what the foundation um, did to address or resolve or include those comments and feedback that we get. So I'll pause here um, in what we've heard today. So I think what I'm hearing in general overall is, is questions about um, engaging with the community and, and also looking at you know, the, the diversity within our community and making sure that the Kuya Water Foundation's engaged with all water users. Um, also hearing questions about you know, what will we do looking forward this and and i'll say this this isn't meant to be a short-term project it really really will expand multiple decades um and and i think as we we get things launched and started you know um it's important that these dialogues continue um i'll pause here and and ask malka um to add or if Raina, if you wanted to add anything to what you're hearing in our conversation here today? Well, the only thing I would add, Sarah, is that I, you know, what I hear you saying is that this is, a, this is the beginning of the conversation, not the end. And that, uh, uh, you know, I just want to add that it's certainly our intent that the uh, feedback um, be a continuous part of this process. So, Any other comments? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. That's it. Um, that was that was that's the end of what we wanted to present here today. We're welcome to stay around and have more casual conversations if anybody is interested. Um, before we wrap it up, though, we wanted to ask all of you to invite, you know, maybe five of five people that you know are within the area to complete um, an impacted resident survey that is on the kaweawater.org or to email us or to leave a voicemail at the phone number. Um, again, as Jonathan mentioned, we're looking to have this, this first draft of the early action plan completed by or before February 22nd. So we're hoping to hear from you all um, before February 17th so we can incorporate um, that into the early action plan itself. And of course, that dialogue will be continuing for a long time, but we do need to have this first draft completed pretty soon. So I'm looking forward to, to hearing from you all or other people that, that you know are engaged with. So Malka, is there anything else I've forgotten? I don't think so. Are, are there any other, what, yeah, you know, we can put up the last slide. To remind people again, yeah, yeah, information. Yeah, we just really want to remind everyone that there are other ways. Meetings are, we know that meetings, particularly uh, virtual meetings, are not always easy for people to uh, connect with, even if there aren't technical difficulties. So, we just want to emphasize that there are other ways for people to both ask questions and give feedback. So with that, unless there's anything else, I will stop sharing my screen now. And um, to say thank you all, I really do appreciate the conversations that we're having that'll, that are ongoing. And um, thank you for spending your time on a, on a Sunday here with us and, and really appreciate this, this involvement as, as we get these early action plans developed and um, just appreciate um, what, what was added here today. So 
with that, we can kind of hang out and talk if anybody wants to. Um, and we'll and stop. It, I, I'm going to hang up, but I, I uh, do want to just say that I thought this was, uh, again, excellent information. And it looks like the presentation is evolving um, okay. and, and adding in some key points. And uh, appreciate that. And yeah, appreciate you guys being willing to do these at different times to maximize uh, potential for community involvement in these meetings. So uh, good job. Oh, thanks, JP. Yes, as we get feedback, we're incorporating that into the, the presentations themselves and how these meetings are hosted as well. So thank you. Appreciate that. Just adding my thanks and uh, thanks for being here. Well, I'm not hearing any more discussion or comments or conversations. So with that, we'll say goodbye to those of you that are left and, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you guys. Bye.